Escuchadme un segundito porque es importante lo que voy a contar de él. Él es profesor emérito del Instituto Nacional de Salud y Bienestar de Finlandia. Ey, que nos han dicho que hayamos bajado de decibelios al principio, ¿os acordáis? <risa> pues vamos a hacerlo. Se llama Tom Ankil. Él es especialista en enfoque dialógico y en embrollos multiinstitucionales, que seguro que sabéis lo que es. Y si no con el nombre, lo habéis vivido en carnes propias, que es cuando en los diferentes servicios, cuando se atiende a una misma persona, diferentes profesionales, se produce ese jaleo, esa manera diferente de entender y que se atasca y que no se puede avanzar. Pues él es especialista en embrollos multiinstitucionales, además también en haber desarrollado tanto programas como de formación como redes dialógicas. Uno de los métodos que él ha desarrollado se llama diálogos de anticipación, que lo que hace es generar los pasos para construir un buen futuro y además también abordar las preocupaciones de manera respetuosa y con ese diálogo abierto. Hoy vamos a poder conocerle mejor. Él ha publicado numerosos artículos científicos, también libros. Viene aquí a ofrecernos esta conferencia y además también lo que vamos a poder realizar y disfrutar con él es ese acercamiento al enfoque dialógico desde diferentes perspectivas, desde el progreso que nos eh, facilita, que nos ofrece, pero también de esos giros que a veces se dan con el enfoque dialógico. Así que estamos con muchísimas ganas de escucharle a Tom Arnkill y le damos la bienvenida con un aplauso, por favor. Adelante. Kaisho. Dialogista Maeteak. Hola, querido, queridos dialoguistas. First of all, I would uh, ask you to all, all to stand up and turn to your right, please. Stand up and turn to your right. And place your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. And give the person a nice massage. And then turn back and thank the person and turn all the way to your left and a nice massage to the person. Okay, and now we can turn back and sit down. Thank you. Okay. So, dialogues are about the body and the soul, all right? We have been spending some time here already. Uh, I would like to talk about, this sounds, what I'm talking about sounds like a, a personal narrative, which it is, but I'm, I want to highlight some turning points, total turning points on the path of dialogity. And I think that these, where you have to turn totally, uh, teach you a lot about what dialogity is. So, we started with my colleague in the 80s uh, with research and development of social work. And social work is at sort of a nexus of a lot of 
networks. So if you want to study networks, look at social works, because social work is a meeting point of a lot of networks. And what we did was we studied these networks by um, asking the social workers to do something different and to anticipate what happens. How do the professionals and clients around them react if they change their activity? First, you have to think, what have I done so far? And what is a change? What would be an appropriate change, a positive change? And then, let's see what happens in the networks. So this is how the anticipations came into my, my uh, studies in the 80s. But then we changed the idea. We were looking at uh, professional help in education, social work, uh, mental health, uh, stuff like this, uh, from organizations. Why not change the view and look at it from the client view, from the cases? Instead of looking at cases from organization windows or organization approach, how do the professions look like if you look at them from the, from the uh, cases? So this brought us to what has been coined as multi-problem families or multi-problem cases. Something that, uh, that Maria Carmen also uh, referred to. But there was a notion by Imber, uh, Evan Imber Black in, in, in America that don't talk about multi-problem families. Talk about multi-agency families. That is much more complex. Because if you have a family with multiple needs, you will have a multiplicity of agencies around them. And this is a very complex system to handle. So <clears throat> we, as uh, was introduced, we concentrated on how multi-agency networks can get stuck and how to help them to get unstuck. And this is something, you know, I've been in several places around the world and asked the question, you know, have you, uh, in your country, do you have experiences where multi-professional networks might get stuck? Yes, you go anywhere you go and they say yes. We made a survey in Finland and we were asking, you know, how many, which sort of a percentage of your cases would be like this? And the estimate was that uh, 30, 40 percent, something like that. No, it's much, much less, but it feels more. This is what takes your energy. So we thought that, okay, if you can help professionals to relieve this, to, to get unstuck, it's a huge relief, it saves a lot of energy. And that's what we wanted to concentrate on, the sort of difficult cases, complex cases. And how do you get into these complex cases? is about the compartmentalization of work. Sectors, so <clears throat> what is in the, I'm trying to depict here is that your everyday life is not in sectors, compartments. It is a whole that you can't divide. Your life is like this. But in the service system, it will be divided into slices. So your, your life is met in slices. And this brings about the question of integration. How to integrate the work that it would meet the whole life situations. All over the world you are asking how to integrate professional work uh, when you have these situations where clients and families have multiple needs. Okay, this is what we concentrated on and trying to make a sort of dialogical crossings over the sector uh, boundaries. The first idea was that we asked, we, we, we had projects like yours uh, in Finland, uh, several people in, in two municipalities, and we asked them, do you have cases where you get stuck? 
And they said, oh, yes. Okay, could, you, could we have a dialogical meeting with these cases? Concerning these cases? Oh, yes. We would want to try a dialogical approach. Would you want to experiment? Yes. And they were sort of skeptical, you know, what would happen? We asked these professionals who were working with the case to come to a meeting, and then we had anticipations with them. So uh, we were inviting only those professionals who work with the case, who have a personal connection through their work. Because if you anticipate uh, in a case that you're not working with, it's abstract. But if you're working with the case, you are anticipating your relationships. And this is the, this is the core, so to speak, your relationships. So we didn't invite anyone outside the relationship. We didn't say that, okay, someone from psychiatry, someone from social work, but no, the person the person who's working, so that they would be involved and it would be their relationships that they, they anticipate. We separated talking and listening, and we were two facilitators, S.I. Eriksson and myself, and we were asking questions, just questions, only questions, no advice. We were helping each other to bite our tongues, you know. You, it's so easy to start to give advice. And that's how you get involved in the case that you're not working with. So, just questions. Like this, professionals around the table, table we, two facilitators. And the questions were like this. What happens if you do nothing? So there's the social worker, there's the psychiatrist, there's the school so, uh, teacher, there's you know, whoever around the family. What happens if you do nothing? they start anticipating. And what we found out there, or what the, the professionals found out, that they know very little about the personal networks of the people. They started asking, do they actually have uh, relatives in the same town? Who, who would they turn to? They didn't know. They were the family workers, family social workers, family therapists who know, knew the family, the whole family. But uh, others knew their client, and that's all. The next question, what could you do appropriately differently? Something, you know, a change that would be a positive change, but it would be a change. There you have to think, what have I been doing so far? And what would, you, would be a change? And what happens if you do it? Who responds and how? Okay, how would the, the network of people respond? It worked very well. It, was, it worked like an angel. They got ideas, listening to each other, talking and listening were so separated. They got a lot of ideas what they could do. And the final question was, what, what would you actually do next? But, and they were very focused, very, very keen on this. But, uh, I got more and more ashamed. The more progress we had this, the, the more uneasy I started feeling. And the question was, where are the clients? Where are the families? These were the professionals talking about the families. We were talking about the families behind their backs. And I, I started feeling, no, this was, it really was a progress because they got unstuck. This, it was a progress, but I thought, this is not, this is not right. This is not ethical. This is not what, this is not the, what dialogues are about. And especially my colleague and friend, Jaakko Seikkula, was doing open dialogues. And the idea in psychiatry was that everything is open. You don't have pre-client meetings so that you decide what you do in the meeting. But you go into the meeting without decisions and everything is done openly. And here we are with S.I. Eriksson having these dialogues behind the backs of the clients. No. 
So we encouraged these workers, these social workers, psychiatrists, medical doctors, so on. Okay, how about these cases that you have, these muddled cases, these complex cases? How about bringing the families? How about bringing the clients? They said, okay, we'll try, we'll try. We had, I remember the moment. In the morning, we had a meeting with no clients. The old model, which is now the old model, the original anticipation dialogue model. And then we had a break and we had a walk with Esa, my colleague, and I noticed that there's a person for the next meeting, for the afternoon meeting, that I didn't know by face. And as, as Heike pointed out, you, you learn by name and you learn the faces when you're done doing a project with people, doing the practice. And I thought, said to Esa, this might be a client. This might be someone from the family. Okay, if it is someone from the family, can we ask these questions, what happens if you do nothing? Esa, who was a psych psychologist from mental health, uh, mental, you know, uh, uh, psychiatric hospital that he had been working here. How about if it's a suicidal case? You don't ask what happens if you do nothing. Dangerous, wrong, you can't do that. What would you do appropriately, differently, and so on? You can't ask the same questions when the clients are there. So we have to think everything anew. I had been doing with my brother consultation for firms and organizations, and my brother knew of uh, a method where you asked the, the uh, professionals in the organizations and the managers when they had a crisis situation or reform or something to send a letter from the future. And we had tried that, and it worked well. And we, com we started improvising, you know, why don't you write an article in the paper in the future? Give the speech of your mayor in the future. And we had consultation to an organization which, which, which was, you know, very, very worried about what, what happened in their change. And the, the atmosphere changed. So I told Esa, Let's try something like that. If it is a family, uh, what should we do? We ask, mm, let's assume that a year has passed and things are well. What are you happy about? You go into the future and then what did you do? What did others do to help you? And then what were you worried about and what made your worries smaller so that you and at the happy note, and not what are your worries. That's not the last question. Okay, let's try. Esa, the psychologist, I'm a social scientist. Uh, used to be a primary school teacher. Uh, we decided that I will ask the questions. And Esa will write public notes. Because Esa was trained as a family therapist, so he could get involved uh, helping the family, not just asking, because he had all sorts of methods in his rucksack. He would start control the situation. I didn't, so I would be sort of more innocent. Now, I want to make a point here, discussing with Jaakko Seikula. We were writing a book, and, and I was asking him, you know, what would you say is the core of open dialogues? And he was thinking and thinking, we went on a long, long walk, and he said, okay, now I have it. It would be, don't put your best methods of control into action. He said that he has been trained as a family therapist, also a psychoanalysis analyst. He has a bag full of methods of controlling the situation. And when you get anxious in the situation, you start to control. You, try, you think that, okay, this would be helpful, this would be helpful. Then you start to use your methods instead of waiting and listening. 
And he said, okay, don't put your best means of control into action because there's something better coming. And the better won't come if you start to control. All right? So these were the new questions. Inviting these people, and what we learned from the previous one was that, okay, uh, you separate talking and listening, and you, you uh, take public notes, and you have two facilitators asking only questions, no advice. The only advice in uh, facilitator training is don't give advice. So this is what we then, then did. You know the questions, people who uh, have had the training, and then there are people who have, have not had the training here. So you, you decide with the clients, with the family, uh, what would be an appropriate sort of step into the future. A year, perhaps, and so on. OK, let's say it's a year. I always take my calendar out. Let's see what is the, uh, the uh, 18th of, of June 25, a year from now. OK, it's a Monday or whatever. Would that be OK? Let's decide. Then we write the new calendar. We are there. Then there are several ways of going into, into the future. My favorite, what I use always, is that, OK, if we would go into the future, and now we are in the future, I would say, say isn't it fascinating that people always change the, choose the same place they were sitting? A year ago, you were sitting in exactly the same place. And what is more surprising, you are wearing the same clothes. You know, they, they wear pretty clothes, and I, I, I uh, congratulate. And I know this, I'm, I'm wearing the same clothes. Okay. This is how you sort of playfully go into the future. There are people, people use different methods. And I've noticed that I've, I've done this quite a lot of times. I've never come to a situation where clients or the family would not go into the future. It's much more difficult for the professionals because they are trained to look into the past. What was the past and how did the problems evolve and now we are here with the problems? The two things that you don't talk about in anticipation dialogues is the past or problems. The two things that you are trained in when you have your professional training. You talk about the future and worries. And what you are talking about when you talk about what were you worried about? Because the questions, okay. It's a year, a year has passed, and uh, what are you especially happy about? What did you do to make these things happen? And who helped you and how? And then, what were you worried about a year ago, so to speak, which is just today, this moment, and what made your worries smaller? Okay. So you are helping these people to go into the future in their mind, but what you are actually helping these people to talk about, to think about, and to talk about, is their hopes and worries right at the moment, but from a future perspective. You can imagine if you ask you know, people, you start asking, what are you uh, worried about today? And what would you think that would help you? This is a very typical question, very difficult to answer. OK, start from a good future. And you ask, what are you especially happy about? And you have surprises because you separate talking and listening, and people are hearing. The mother is hearing what the, what the husband is saying, or what the child is saying, and so on. A lot of surprises. <laughs> and I've noticed a change in the atmosphere when people start to use this tool, because you are handing people a tool to make thought experiments. OK, you can use this future tool. And there's, when they start, there's, there's a very definite change in the atmosphere when people really get on to this, this uh, imagining a good future. And they almost applaud to each other, you know, 
you, you can, from an anxious situation, it changes into a very sort of a relieved situation. I'm sure that many of you have noticed this happening. There's a change of atmosphere. That people realize that they have a tool to express their present hopes and worries in a safe way. Then you ask the, the professionals only two questions, not the first one. Uh, things are fine now or better now. What are you especially happy about? Because it's not their family. It's not the professionals, you know, okay. The, you ask the family members, but you ask the professionals what they are doing. What did you do and who helped you? Who helped the professional? And what were you worried about? And what made you less worried? These two questions are professional. And then finally, you return from the future. And although you have been a year in the future or six months in the future, for, for example, in, with senior citizens, a year could be a long time. It could be two months. It could be six months. Uh, you, could, you decide together what, what the time is. Although you have been in the future, you talk about the next steps, not a year's plan. Who does what with whom next? Because this makes it concrete. You do this, I do this. And this is how you can promote plausible hope. Hope that you can believe in. Not just, you know, okay, let's all be hopeful. But hope that you you believe in your heart. And this is the goal of anticipation dialogues. The only goal is that people leave more hopeful than they came. And what makes plausible hope is that you know what you could do and what others could do and that we've decided that we will take the steps. It is plausible because you have a network supporting you. So, the core here is responsiveness. We have been asked, I have been asked several times, because, you know, open dialogues in psychiatry, no structure, no structure at all. Anticipation dialogues, three questions, separating, talking and listening, so on. Structure. Is this a dialogical approach? So, what makes a dialogical approach dialogical is it the responsiveness. So, as you notice, you are not giving advice. You are not telling, the facilitators are not telling people what to do. Everything follows, every little bit follows from what the people say. You collect from what the people say. That's the material. You don't bring any hypotheses, you don't bring any plans, you don't bring any interpretations. You might repeat verbatim what people said. I heard you saying this and this and this. Did I hear you correctly? Which is different to I heard you saying this. Did I understand you correctly? Because understand is an interpretation. Did I hear you correctly? I'm hearing you. I'm following what you say. Okay. So this is, this is the core idea, and I would say that anticipation dialogues are pretty responsive in this case. Then we were asked, okay, these are the very complex cases, but how about so-called early intervention? Around the world, there were projects, and also in Finland, a large process of early intervention. Our team was asked that, okay, do you have anything dialogical for early intervention? We said, yeah, well, let's try. And then we came up with the idea of early dialogues. And, and uh, uh, you know that in early intervention, the idea is that the earlier you intervene, the better chances you have to tackle the problems that might grow. Okay, do something early to uh, not to let the problems grow. 
So these early intervention programs uh, list a lot of uh, symptoms or worrying material. Okay, teachers, you have to look at this. Uh, social workers, look at this, and so on, so on. And then, so the pyramids of, of uh, professional uh, responsibilities. Who should uh, act immediately in, in, at the bottom of the pyramid, and then at the top you have when the case is already uh, into deep, deep problems. And we were asked, you know, okay, could you give a list who should uh, act onto the uh, worrying uh, phenomena and when? And our response was everyone immediately, but to their own worries. React to your own worries immediately in your relationship, but do it dialogically. Do it in a way that respects other people. And how, how do you do it dialogical with respect is that, okay, I used to be a school teacher. I used to be a primary school teacher. And I, I remember situations where I was worried about a child. For example, I thought that, okay, this child is pretty restless all the time and ti tired or, you know, not energetic. What's, what's, what's happening at home? Is there something, you know, that, that, that occupies the child's mind? I have a problem. I wanted to be a good, good teacher. I wanted the, uh, this child to learn. I have a problem. I have a worry in this relationship. I have to do something. Okay, whose help do I need? The parents. I need their help. If I suspect that there's something at home that the child makes the child restless and, and tired, I need the help of the parents. How do you get the help? Ask for it. Not blaming, not saying that, you know, your child is restless at school, you have to do something. But you ask for help. Can we do something together? First, you tell the positive, all the positive. Things I, you know, I've been working with your child. I love the way they draw. Your child draws. We, I've tried this and this and this, in concrete terms. And then, but I'm still worried. I would love to be a better teacher for the child. Can we try something together? Okay, no blaming. That's a dialogical uh, start. The parent might say that no, you don't have to be worried. You, there's nothing to be worried about. Great, tell me more about. I am still worried, but now I'm a bit less worried. Tell me more about this. It's a dialogue situation already. Okay. So that put, that's how we did this, and we started a project uh, all over the country uh, in, in many municipalities, and we drew this, this zones of subjective worry that you have... Relationships where there is no worry, relationships where you have uh, a slight worry that should I actually do, do I something, do I need additional resources, then the extreme would be great worry, constant strong worry, child, client, patient in danger. My means are exhausted, I really have to need a change in the situation now, soon, not later. These are pretty clear. No worry, small worry, great worry. And in between the gray zone where nothing is clear. Your worry is growing, your confidence in your own possibilities are dim diminishing or running dry, and you have a clearly felt need for extra supporters and controllers, controllers but that is your your only clear idea. Am I too worried? Or should I be more worried? And these are exactly the, the, uh, the multi-need, multi-agency cases. This is, this is where this happens. Okay. 
And this is, I have been following making research on, on uh, professionals blaming each other. My favorite case, uh, as, as, as I was a teacher and then, then uh, studying social work, is that maybe this happens in Navarra, I don't know. But you have a meeting with the teachers and social workers, and the, and the teachers would say that, social workers, why don't you come to our help? Because we have these very critical cases, we have these worrying cases, and we call you and you say, we have no time. Please come to our help. And the social workers would respond, uh, was that a worrying case? Come to spend your time with me, a day with me, and you will see worrying cases. That's not a worrying case. That's an easy case. You have to handle these cases in school. We have loads of more worrying cases. Yes, yes, says the teacher, but you should. This is why you... Uh, and it's a tennis match. And then we, we came up with this. I drew this on, on, a, on, on the other side of a banknote. It was the first drawing. Because how to get over this tennis match that the social workers and teachers and the psychiatrists and whoever is trying to say that you should work. And we went to them and asked, where do you find yourself in this case? And it's about you and your relationships. It's not the client alone. It's you and the relationship. And they started, okay, yeah, well, um, this, this is my uh, small worry. Okay, whose help do you not need and how do you get it? But this, this was a success, but a turnabout again. The, the, uh, I told you already that, that ask for help, do not blame. But then this zone of proximal worry uh, graph spread around the country, especially the schools and teachers. They were so, who had not the dialogical training. Wonderful, we've been looking for something. And they started grading which children are small worry children, which are gray zone children, and no worry children, and, and great worry children, the names of the children, and then, and the parents, when they saw this, they said, what, what the heck is happening? My child is here, a gray zone child, what does that mean? And, and I, because we had good connections with the, with the Ministry of Education and, and we were asking the minister and, and, and the officials, please tell the schools to stop this. You're not, you mustn't classify children. It's about relationships. It's not the child who's in the gray zone. It's you. You, the relationship. And do something about it. Don't classify. And then the Ministry of Education sent, sent the... Uh, Notice to schools, I had a chance to go on TV, on the main channel, to plead the teacher, stop this, please, and try to tell about dialogity. And the response was, don't take this candy away. This, the taste has been so good. We want to classify children. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that, that Professional work has been a lot about the past and the problems and others, how to change the others, not about relationships, not about changing your own uh, actions in your relationships. So this is the huge change that we need to make. The only thing, the one thing in the world you can change, the only thing you can change in the world is your own activity. Let's see what happens. I want peace in the world. Okay, do something about it. It's the only thing I can change in my relationships. You want to change something? Do something. But please anticipate and, and try 
to make it a dialogical relationship. Ask for help. Well, then we started training people, and and uh, and as you've done now, and the the great the the, the problem that we had is that you have the sector-based uh, management system. How do you get over? How do you, because anything you try to do will be back in the se sectors soon anyway. We call this the seven-headed dragon. That okay, you cut one head and you have the head growing back again. We, we went to New Zealand and we saw something that was, was uh, very promising, that they had uh, a managing board, cross-sectoral, you have the managers, and then you had the multi-sectoral meetings of professionals, and you had a full-time coordinator who coordinated with this. We came back to Finland. We need full-time coordinators for this. Jukka was the first full-time coordinator in Rovaniemi. And this was something new. There wasn't uh, 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 on your, on your uh, list of professions, you didn't have full-time coordinators. But some municipalities had the courage to involve. 20 years in Rovaniemi, they still have a full-time coordinator very, very uh, efficient, something that you might be happy to have in Pamplona and other places in, in uh, Navarra. So, that's all. It's anticipation dialogues about responsiveness. I wanted to highlight about these turns because uh, it is, it, it is uh, a slight turn, only 180 degrees we are trying to try and change the professional work. Okay, thank you. You might have questions, comments, and so on.